What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Super pumped to be talking about building the new world with blockchain and decentralization. We have Jim Marcondo joining us on the show. Hi, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot, Alan. It's a pleasure for us to have you on the show. Also in your home, <laughs> which is so nice. Thank you. You guys are great tenants. I'm glad to be supporting your work. Thank you very much. And we're also super pumped to talk about your work. For those that don't know Jim's background, he does business development for blockchain companies coming to Japan. Originally a software engineer, he is very passionate about the technology behind blockchain and decentralization, trying to increase awareness of this important paradigm shift. And you can find Jim's links in the bio below to his LinkedIn and Twitter profile. Jim, I want to start things off by talking about this very big picture. We're having this massive paradigm shift happen. I think people are starting to understand more and more what it meant to have centralization of power. Now things are becoming decentralized. Give us this big abstract perspective on what the centralization of power initially was. And now we're moving to the decentralization. Right. Um, so, you know, we, why, how did centralization come, come up? What is the, why did it come about, right? Previously, when we're doing transactions, you know, if we're not doing it face to face, you know, we have to rely on this intermediary. So maybe, you know, I want to send money to somebody. I, if I can't see you in person, I have to send it over a bank or if you, any kind of transaction, you know, if we're not going to do it face to face, we, have, we usually use an intermediary. Over time, those intermediaries get more and more powerful. They start increasing transaction fees. They start censoring transactions. Oh, you, you're not allowed to send money to him or it's going to cost you this. They, they end up having a lot of power. Now, sometimes that's good. You know, they can maybe enforce the law or maybe enforce a certain level of service. But more than not, these intermediaries have kind of grown out of control in our society and they add a lot of hidden costs in all kinds of you know, transactions. So that's, that's kind of how I like to see the context for why we need like decentralized third parties. And so kind of nowhere before now was there this way to do a peer to peer transaction, but not in person, you know, with, you had to trust this intermediary, but thanks to blockchain, you can do this in a way where we both agree on some terms in advance. And then with, as soon as, if, as long as those terms are met, some transaction will automatically occur. And it's basically, unstoppable. No one can change or, un or stop it after we agree to those terms. And so that type of transaction, there's different words for it. But for instance, Ethereum would call that like a smart contract. So mm -hmm. using this Ethereum blockchain, we can agree on some terms to do some kind of business operation. And then it, once we commit to that, it automatically executes. So that's kind of how I look at it. And but then if you but what makes me passionate about it is you see like how our society is in such need for this type of technology, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if I want to send money Western Union to South America, they charge me this huge rate. I have to agree to their terms. I can't send it to certain people. That's that, that's the easy example. But there's all kinds of intermediaries you didn't even realize were there. And, you know, it's going to take time. But basically, a lot of those intermediaries will be either reduced or eliminated. And the the fees they're, they're incurring and the power they have will shrink. Maybe getting to the point where, you know, we don't need them anymore. And then... We also can own, once we create this network of value, we can be owners in that network of value as well. Instead of a lot of times the intermediary owns the business and it's very successful and they are the one to reap all the rewards. But using the same concept, the, the users and the providers of liquidity in this network can also kind of own the network and share in the rewards. But that's a little bit different thread. And you give this, you gave us a couple examples, but one of the most, I think, important examples is the way that we exchange this thing called money. This one is one of the most important ones. This one of the most important applications of what decentralization technology can do for us, eliminating the third party from the process and giving the power back into people's hands. But again, one of the things that comes up a lot is, well, right now we have all this faith in this currency that we use. All of a sudden, although it is, yes, numbers in a digital ledger, in a centralized bank's digital ledger, now it's, well, what if we just transition those numbers in the digital ledger to a cryptocurrency rather than the fiat currency? 
And then we have the blockchain that enables us to be able to very, very immutably store those transactions, the, the way that the money is moving over time. Do banks even currently have a storage mechanism like that where they can see these traces of money? Well, I mean, that's, that's part of the reason why it takes like three days to do a wire transfer because they've got these batch processes that run and then they get audited and checked to make sure no one modified it because, you know, and so, but it, get in, it gets very complicated. Um, but one thing I just want to say is that, you know, simply changing to a blockchain is not, you know, there can be centralized or permission blockchains, you know, like the, the government could say, oh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna make a blockchain that we control, right? A blockchain doesn't necessarily imply decentralization. It can be a centralized blockchain but um what we're aiming for yeah is is like a decentralized mod say ledger for money um that's not in control you know for instance the, some government central bank could could create a, a blockchain based digital currency for their country but they could decide all the rules themselves we're gonna they could still make it just like the traditional and we're gonna control who's allowed to use this blockchain and we're gonna inflate the currency if we want you know like there's nothing stopping them right but yeah. say like Bitcoin, well, it's fixed at 21 million Bitcoin. They can't change that, right? Anybody can participate. They can't block someone from participating. So that's what gives it these nice qualities. But you could you could make a bad, you know, blockchain solution, a very centralized blockchain as well. Yeah. Again, this big promise of being able to do something like take and put power back into people's hands on a peer-to-peer -peer cash transfer is so so important yet also this is just one of so many of the applications unlike this just this big history perspective it's so interesting looking at the origins of money how money even came to be then what we're actually doing with it today how it even works one of the things that so many wealthy people talk about is when you're not educated about money in school then you become poor when you educate yourself about money you have a much higher propensity to earn money to gain money to become wealthy these types of things what are stocks what are investments into real estate into all different aspects how do you diversify a portfolio what are those things how do you save money what's compound interest but then what is this money backed by? Or is this a shared hallucination of money? What are cryptocurrencies? Are they also in a sense a shared hallucination that is maybe just a little bit immutably stronger in a sense? And then what are the other applications that can come from a blockchain style of life? Where like we initially did thousands of years ago of exchanging things of that we wanted and we wanted to make sure that the other person got the item and we got the compensation for the item now things are happening digitally with these exchanges you are you are in the process of selling a vehicle right there's these ideas of can we just smart contract this out skip right. yeah so th there's all these different applications as well yeah there's there's a lot of great points just kind of unwrapping a few of those um first on the whole like do you need to back it or not you know of course i, I love commodities you know i think gold and silver they're very nice you know they're tangible the price is manipulated. It's unclear of the quantity that's out there. You know, they they, and it's just you can't really buy and sell it, right? You've got to. How do you splice it up? How do you store it? How do you send it? You know, it's good maybe if you're going to store it in your in your secret stash or vault or something. But it's not, it's not as practical for our, our current society. Although I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to uh, to criticize commodities, but the thing about you know say Bitcoin or other decentralized cryptocurrencies is. Okay, yeah, they're, they're technically not backed by anything, but I would argue that's that's actually a benefit because trying to back it with something actually adds a point of failure. Like, say you're going to make digital gold, and you say I'm going to have a blockchain with a cryptocurrency where like one unit of this coin is one ounce of of gold, but it's like you're actually tying it into the real world. Now you're giving yourself a weakness. Well, is that vault audited? You know, is that is that money there? Is that ounce there at all times? Like, who audits mm. that? You know, there's no way to check that in code, right? Like. You're relying on someone's you know honor to say, yeah, we actually have one ounce in that vault, and it's always there, like we promise we do. Where if it's literally purely digital, you can just look at the code, right? Like, look at the Bitcoin code. There's only 21 million Bitcoin. No one can change that unless everybody in the network agrees to change it, and they're not going to do that because it would change the rules. No one would, you know, it's this economic incentive. They don't have an. No one would agree to that because it's not in their economic best interest. Basically. So then the cryptocurrencies don't necessarily need to be backed by anything. Right. So I think that's one kind of 
errors in thinking. It's like people think, well, it's got to be backed by something. But like backing it by something actually makes it weaker because now you're tying it to a physical thing that needs to be audited. So, But making it a deflationary currency. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I kind of don't have a strong opinion on that or not. It's true. Like what's going to uh. happen Bitcoin like 30 years from now when it, they stop making new ones? Like it's just going to go through the roof. Some cryptocurrencies are constantly adding more every yeah. year. And so I'm not an economist. Um, you know, at least you know the terms. Like it can only be inflated by this much per month or not or deflated you know by this much over you know for 30 years but those terms can also change well but they but everybody would have to vote on that change. Vote on you know that they'd change. have to fork a new set of rules into the system okay. and that that would that wouldn't be an easy procedure okay. Okay. but it's true it could it could change but people if you say are going to act in their best in their self-motivated economic interest you have some faith that like they wouldn't just make a really change that would cause everyone to lose faith in the currency and cause the value to go down mm -hmm. um so that that's one kind of topic that so I, I that that I wanted to pick up on that that you were saying, and one other thing um, I also just wanted to say is it's the whole financial inclusion aspect of it. I kind of didn't touch on it before, but not only can the intermediary censor or withhold or add fees or choose the marketplace pricing, but they can also say, well, you know, you're not in our country, we're not going to serve you, right? All the it's I mean everybody knows. So going back to the unbanked side, where it's like. With a cryptocurrency wallet, you know, all you need is a smartphone or a computer and you can be anywhere in the world. And now you've got a bank account, basically. You can go and do some mechanical Turk or task rabbit type bounty task for somebody in a, in a rich country and you can get paid in some cryptocurrency in Africa, right? And so they, they say like it's, it's enabling like global, a new generation of global commerce with inclusion for all, less friction. Um, those are some of the... the, yeah. the talking points that, that people like to toss around as well. I think we were talking about this uh, a couple of days ago as well when we were talking about how cool it is to do things like be able to uh, split up uh, the assets into really tiny fractions and then to be able to pay five or ten or a hundred dollars into, into ownership of these rapidly growing assets which then also gives people the ability to come in as a stakeholder um, and just inclusive stakeholding in general but then you give this example of all it takes is me to have uh, a, a mobile phone with an internet connection and a, and a cryptocurrency wallet for me to be able to do things like uh, do tasks uh, to earn to earn money yeah. it also you know we 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 um we just had um bio on the show and we were talking to him as well about just this interesting philosophical uh point in general about how everyone just looking at the united states or china or many different places and just saying we want to compete we want to be like and like the the developing world developing like that is not necessarily just all that great in general period so this also goes to um, thinking about new systems and just new ways of living life in general that don't necessarily need to f f funnel into the economic machinery that is trying to be um, pushed on to say that why don't you earn this, you know, these couple bucks by spending your time on on this specific task as well. Um, we were I wanted to also spend a little time on this one with you. Um, this this we we we. Um, we have for the longest time been exchanging things of value and then not necessarily following through with someone else uh, about what that thing, that agreement was. Then we had these notaries or lawyers come into place that then wrote these things into code that we then both signed and then we put things into escrow, made exchanges, these types of things. And now it seems like I can just download a document from the internet and now pay three dollars or whatever for that document and then do the exchange on a blockchain like ethereum and then you give me your car i give you five thousand bucks and it can just be like well we're right. getting close to that you know it's still you know right now um there are companies that are working on either libraries of smart contract templates that you can use to create these common agreements i think there's i think there's i don't know if any of them have really been completely fleshed out and caught on yet, but there are many working on it because Other, otherwise you'd have to, you know, program some smart contract yourself with these conditions, but it requires, you know, being a software engineer. But we're seeing that people are working on both libraries, templates that you can, like, you know, you can go online and get legal templates, kind of similar, like go online and get a smart contract template, right? And then we both, you know, sign it using our, 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 you know, cryptocurrency wallets and then we, or we put some deposit into it, you know, and then 
it holds it until some conditions are met and then you know does it or um, also uh, there's also technologies that are actually trying to translate like human contracts into smart contracts um, some of them require a certain amount of like user assistance others just try to use natural language processing and and then create you like oh this is what we think mm. the smart contract version of your legal contract is maybe make some changes and so a lot of people are working on that but I don't think any of them are really you know live with lots of case studies yet but we're definitely getting there. Um, you also mentioned uh, developing, um, yeah, de de developing nations, and it's true. You know, a lot of these blockchain use cases, maybe initial or initial users, are probably better in developing nations because they have no infrastructure, and it's like they have much more need of it. We're trying to replace, like, you know, a payment system in a developed country. Well, it already works. There's a lot of vested interest in keeping the system as it is but like going to a small new country that doesn't have the same type of network it's a great opportunity to kind of like get these things running and then kind of export it to the rest of the world um which is why you see the like estonia succeeding yeah. so much with digital citizenry even like philippines yeah estonia yeah. like places in africa you know because they just didn't have or even india and like southeast asia um, they really need these these systems more. You know, like land registry is a big one, where you land know, like a lot of countries, they don't know who owns yeah. what land, and the government does a really bad keeping track of it. And there's all these claims after you buy it, someone says, "No, I own that." And maybe you can't trust the government because the government is corrupt. But why, if you put it in a blockchain, everybody could see all the transactions, and you maybe you don't even need the government in, in the end. You know, how does the government adapt to that? But it really can force all the parties to be honest by putting the land registry in a blockchain. And it's so simple and cheap than trying to make some paper process that relies on employing a lot of people who could be corrupted. Um, what are the mechanisms that prevent uh, someone tampering with an immutable ledger of my property being this piece of land in this city? Well, okay, that's the beauty of the blockchain, right? People say like... Um, you know, traditionally we've had a shared, what they call it like a distributed decentralized database. But the problem with that usually is that there still is some database administrator. And that database administrator can go in there and change records if they're dishonest or cheating. Or a hacker can go in and also get that right access and go in there and maliciously change records. But the whole beauty of this blockchain with the chain of blocks, you know, each block kind of has a snap. Like each cryptocurrency is a different time interval, but like Bitcoin is about 10 minutes. It's yeah. like each block contains the last 10 minutes worth of transactions. And the thing is, there's something called a cryptographic hash function, which basically says, like, if I have, you know, these a thousand transactions, here's a number that represents those thousand. Like, maybe it's like, you know, like a 20 digit number. And if you change one little bit of those transactions, it's going to change this 20 digit number. So, like, this is called a hash function. And so what they do is they embed like the hash of the previous block in the current block and they just keep doing that all up the chain. Mm -hmm. So if you try to change some block that was like, you know, 10 blocks ago, you'd have to go and recalculate all the in-between blocks and basically in the case of Bitcoin, it would take so much computation, it would be impossible. So by using this cryptographic hash function and this chain of blocks, you're basically making it computationally impossible for someone to go back and change the past. Now, someone can try to attack like the current block but you basically need to control like in different different cases it could be 51% of the network or 67% of the network and well that's a you know we can get in these discussions about security but the idea is that well hopefully it's it would be impossible for me to like double the amount of computers mining bitcoin so i could attack bitcoin now maybe you know you could try to there you know people might try to scheme ways to do that but it's kind of these are some of the ways that it's secure and so by doing that, it kind of guarantees no one can go back and alter the past. And so that, that's kind yeah. of this fun, part of the fundamental innovation. They call it like double spend. How do I know I'm not double, yeah, yeah. spending the same coins twice or going back yeah. and modifying someone else's transaction? It's basically next to impossible. Yeah, yeah. So a cryptographic hash function is the paradigm that exists today that can't be tampered with until something like the quantum supremacy is achieved by Google, which they just released content on uh, then it gives them computational ability to do so well there's different there's different hashes and some of them are more quantum resistant than others quantum and, resistant yeah, hashes yeah what an what a point and okay. if so, if one of them does none of them have like fallen victim to quantum computing yet um it's true it could happen in the future i'm not a quantum computing expert but, but what i've heard people say is you know, like if it looks like one of them is getting is getting close to be broken by quantum computing then that blockchain will just hard fork to a different hash um, algorithm and I don't know like 
are they going to, I don't know how that impacts the past coins, but basically they would, they would modify the algorithm to use a quantum uh, resistant hash function. And there are ones that are supposedly more quantum resistant, but I'm not a cryptographer really, but you're, we just have to watch that. <laughs> that, that right there is how do you make a quantum resistant hash function? How do you make it so s sophisticated and successful that then it becomes resistant to the potential malicious attacks of quantum computing? Yeah. It's this is a very interesting conversational point because so many people are deciding to invest their money into things like uh, cryptocurrencies and then uh, and then just believing that it's absolutely certainly never ever ever going to have a massive issue like that but the computational power of quantum computation is just rising so quickly and that one is that one's a big one that one's yeah, a big there's one. a little risk but people are you know trying to stay uh, you know people are watching it very closely but yeah nothing is is full, foolproof i like that um the Quantum resistant hashes, everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. I'm not a cryptographer, but like, you know, it's so mathematical. But it's still, like, yeah, cryptography it is. is so important for decentralization and yes, securing yes. the transactions because you don't want anyone to interfere, you know, all about this. You don't want any third party to be able to interfere with what we've chosen. So then, how do you know then? Um, how do how do when I register this wallet? How do you know then that it is the funds in this specific wallet? But then you don't associate that wallet with my unique identifier of my name. And then similarly with when you were talking about the piece of land, how do you not identify your name with this piece of land? Well, you, it, you optionally can, right? Like you get basically like a, a public key and a private key for your wallet, and that like the private key is some number that only you know, and the public key is another number which everybody else refers to you by. And so you just pass out that number to a lot of other people and they want to do transactions with you. you and all they know is you, that number. You only give out your public key to other people. Your private key only right. you know. Right. Only and you, you yeah. know. And you don't even digitally store yeah, that. Yeah, you don't places. even want to take a picture of it. Don't take or, pictures yeah, or, of it. Yeah. You write it, store it somewhere. It's very, very yeah, safe. Right. And so, so pup public key wise can be widely distributed and that is how people pay you from there also public key to public key yes right payment right right and so they call it like pseudo anonymous and now there are there are ways where people are trying to obfuscate that and add privacy which is a separate discussion but let's just go with the simple case of these pseudo anonymous public keys you know i'm number you know 12 you're number 32 and um you know people can see that 12 sent 32 12 did a transaction with 32 but they don't know who is 12 and who is 32 but you could actually say like well i'm going to sign some other transaction voluntarily stating my ID, right? I could say like, oh, well, Jim is associated with 12 and I'm gonna sign some message with my private key, which only I can do. And then they're like, well, Jim says, 12 says he's Jim. Well, that's still, you're trusting me, but you could trust a, a, you could trust a third party, could be a government or a bank or somebody. And that, that third party could vouch for it too and say, I met Jim and I looked at his ID and he's definitely 12 and they could sign it. And then like, but so they call these attestations, but each, you can have multiple parties attest to other people's information. Of course, you, you're trusting that party that attested to it, but it might be someone you can trust. So you could, this is kind of, this, and they call this a self-sovereign identity. So like I can have all these, I, on my same wallet, number, you know, number 12, I can have my name attested to, I could have my, my, my uh, salary attested to, my payments on time attested to. They can all be linked to me, but the beauty about blockchain is that they're all encrypted and I can allow other people to see that or not. So it's like, maybe I have this attestation that says number 12 is Jim as proved by the United States Post Office, but it's kind of hidden by default. And if I want to allow you to see it, I can, I can give you permission, then you can go in and check you it. You can give just one public You can kind of key. opt in for this one I, attestation. You say like, yeah, that okay. when, when the post office attested to the fact that I'm Jim, Here's this. I'm gonna I'm gonna allow you to see that one bit of data, and then you yeah. can go in and prove it. Oh yeah, that is the post office that had tested it. But otherwise, it stays private. So this is this kind of opt-in privacy model. They call it soft self-sovereign identity, where you can soft se self, -sovereign self self sovereign sovereign identity. identity. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big blockchain buzzword too. So you control all these profile mm -hmm. attributes and who can see them under what conditions. Otherwise, they're all encrypted, basically. Until that gets leaked, if possible. Like if you do yeah. do a little self, soft self-sovereign no, identity. Just self-sovereign identity. Just yeah. self-sovereign. So if you do a self-sovereign identity for the post office or for any of these other... Well, they add an attestation to your identity, basically. And and then if they know that you're 12, then they know that they if that gets leaked, yeah. then other people know you're 12. 
Yeah, right. Yeah. But I mean, but you could maybe selectively leak that. I'm not sure. Maybe they they they, so, they share it amongst each other. But like this kind of leads me to the next bit, which is that it seems that you have to study a ridiculous amount yeah. of cutting edge, yeah, knowledge to know. You, you know, s- s- um, a quantum resistant hash functions, <laughs> right? There is um, um, a, a, sel- a self sovereign uh, identity, yeah. right? So. And there's just new and new white papers yeah. being published in the space all the time. And so people are, you know, you gave these use cases for land. Yeah. There's use cases for virtual citizenship, for exchanging goods via smart contracts. You said yeah. there's smart contract libraries. There's all yeah. the cryptocurrencies, you know, and you're it's trying to get, small. you're trying to help them, you know, get into Japan or you're trying to keep an idea going on of like what's happening. What do you do for parsing and what are your favorite concepts too? Well, I mean, yeah, so user ex- the blockchain industry ha- definitely has a challenge with user experience and onboarding new users, non-technical users, older users, you know, and creating. The- but ideally, you should make an app where the-, the person can't even tell there's blockchain underneath, right? Now we're a little ways away from that, but people are trying to do that. Um, it's take it's taking it take some time, but people. So I think we need a lot of evangelism, a lot of education, telling you know, teaching people about it. Everybody, you know, if you if you believe in this technology, you should teach other people about it and then it's going to take time for people to understand it get comfortable with it also for the user experience to improve so that it's doesn't take someone technical to, to figure out how to back up their key and do this and you know and do this transaction that you know that unfortunately that will take time but i think we will get there um and then um uh what was i thinking so that 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 definitely needs to improve. Also, um, there's also some things where people's um, expectations need to change. Where it's like right now, if I forget the password to my bank's website, I don't lose all my money. The ba- I just call up the central authority of the bank, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we're the central authority. We'll just issue a new pass password." You know, and like, I get all my money back. Um, people are used to being Be- stupid because and like, you verify your identity. Yeah, with and then they issue me a new password. Again. But the, the flip yeah. side of that is they can confiscate my money. They can lock my account. The IRS can like tap me and say, "Okay, stop him. Don't let him withdraw anything." Yeah. Or you know, yeah. somebody could you know you know they can you you don't own it either. They're just like your you know they have the control, but they also can get you out of problems. Where it's like with a public key and a private key in a wallet, you lose that private key, and it's like, oh my god, I just you know lost all this money and so people are trying to come up with ways to get around this problem maybe it's like i get five of my friends to vouch for me and if they all agree that i lost my key then it, i can reconstruct my private key and that's called social recovery for instance and so social recovery yeah of one. keys yeah so like, i heard there's another one where you um have a very specific pattern that only you can remember like kind of like if you get immersed into like a virtual uh, reality environment and then you like walk a path right, that, that could, nobody else knows well, right now it's like 12 words or 24 words but that's still a lot to remember but yeah i could see like condensing that 12 word phrase into some geographic pattern or sequence mm-hmm. or choosing some images this is specifically for key recoveries what yeah we're for key about. recovery okay. so you don't lose because if you lose your private key technically because there's no third party now yeah your yeah. funds are all gone because you're not actually holding any funds, your key just unlocks on the blockchain so proving that those funds are yours. So it's mm-hmm. like, the, you know, the blockchain is this decentralized database. The funds are in there. Mm-hmm. But my key proves that those are mine. So I don't, I'm not actually holding any funds. I'm just saying, oh, by, by with this key, I can prove in the database that, those, that that's actually my funds in there. Mm-hmm. But I lose that key. Well, now no one can prove whose funds mm-hmm. those are and it's, you're basically, you know, like, you know, unrecoverable. So people have to understand that risk maybe there's some recovery mechanisms that people develop and understand the benefits and the cons right like yeah if i lose it maybe i'm a lot my money but i have it in my control i can there's no with daily withdrawal limit i can send it to whoever i want around the world instantly you know like no one can stop me it's you know it's mm-hmm. people feel really um the self-custody you know your, your custody for and this asset doesn't have to be cryptocurrency right like we you said it can be like a, a tokenized share in some hard asset you know mm-hmm. or in some revenue stream or in some business model you know it can be all these different things besides yeah. just a currency yeah so it gets quite powerful and then what, what and then what are you when you're looking at all of the different possibility scape and all of the white papers being pub- published what are you most excited about when you see all of the diversity well the, the the big industry problems being solved right now are basically scalability privacy interoperability and upgradeability 
kind of those four things. And so let's break them. Let's break them. Yeah, Bitcoin kind of suffers on all those, or though they're trying to slowly improve it, right? So like scalability, the problem with the blockchain, right, is that each node traditionally, each node is verifying every transaction, and so there's just a li- like they're basically just all like clones of each other, right? Which is great for security and enforcing rules, but it's like well, like after a certain level, like you reach the maximum capacity of one load or how many transactions can be put in a block. And it's like, well, then then like Bitcoin, people have to add more fees to get their transactions processed sooner. And so that's there are people coming up with different solutions to that. And wasn't one of them that we discussed because it's, it's, if this heartbeat of the chain is happening every 10 minutes and it's been happening since 2008, that it's now 11 years well, of this. Right. That's nothing to it. Like the, the, the chain just gets so damn big. It's like, well, now I can't put it on a Raspberry Pi. I have to have a, a huge hard drive in a data center. It has to be an SSD for the IO speed requirements. And it's like. Basically, you want to get as ma- the best decentralization is as many people ver- holding, storing the train and verifying the chain as possible. And it's like mm. the, har- the more specific, the higher spec server you need to you know, store and verify the chain, the more centralized it's going to be because not everybody can afford that kind of server. But there are new protocols coming out trying to decrease those specs and you know, make it more decentralized. Through again. compression? Well, no, through, through cryptography a lot through of it. Cryptography. Is through new consensus algorithm. Someone's, compre- someone's like pruning out old data snapshotting data at certain times so you can just like so you don't have to check every block cryptography there's a lot of different novel approaches in other cryptocurrencies besides bitcoin and bitcoin's got their own thing they're trying to do different ways ways of scaling scalability so when i want to send you just a couple satoshi which is this breakdown so 100 million satoshi in a bitcoin yeah I, it's, it's like 10 to the 8 or something and, yeah and so then ten, yeah. and so then if i just want to send you a couple satoshi my no your one's tra- gonna, yeah your no one's gonna want to yeah. process right that. your transaction fee would be much higher wouldn't it be worth it wouldn't it be worth it so the scalability is also um right low worth cost worth transactions yeah that's huge yeah okay and litecoin is one that's doing well in low well they um yeah so litecoin they they um yeah they they they're yeah they they have they're they're they've improved on bitcoin in that regard for sure okay and then what are the other three yeah so then we said uh, privacy right so the problem with the blockchain too is everybody sees that you know user 12 sent did this transaction with user 32 um now there are way there are novel cryptographic algorithms that can basically like we can code that we did this transaction such that it's provable, but you can't actually see the details of that transaction. And so there are currencies like Zcash and Monero mm. and other ones. And even it's coming maybe to Ethereum and stuff. That's called zero knowledge proofs. It's, a, it's another huge cryptographic concept. Zero but, knowledge proofs also, so kind of, they, they also disguise our transaction. There's different ways. Yeah, they could they could disguise what the value the, the, the transaction being done or even our identities as well. Mm-hmm. Like in Z, in Zcash, they don't even know how many Zcash is in existence because it's it's obfuscated. <laughs> um, for instance, because everything is it's all this ZK snark encrypted confidential transactions. But so the problem with those now is that usually they're much uh, even lower performance, right? It needs mm more cpu time you know more network bandwidth and it's like yeah you thought your blockchain wasn't high performance now now just like when now it's even slower just like when this world switches switched to https and encrypted websites no one wanted to do it because you could only run you know like one tenth the number of https websites that you could at the http website but now we've reached the point where servers don't mind everybody wants the privacy so in time, and they're also so they're trying. That's all in an area of active research, mostly cryptographic. And as the computational speed increases, and the algorithms improve, improve. but then it gets into other problems with governments. Like, no, we want to be able to monitor it. And so there's there's ways of saying like, well, maybe all transactions over ten thousand are made public to a certain entity. Where other one, you know, but they could maybe encode rules like that. Now, do they want to? But so there's mm-hmm. there's all these different possibilities. But so I don't want to. You know, so scale, be, privacy. Privacy, yeah. And then we said um, like interoperability is meaning, one. Meaning what? So it's like I have I'm, I have Bitcoin and you have Ether and how do we swap it with each other without going to a centralized exchange? Or I have some mm. transaction that happened on my network. Maybe my network is, process, is like, you know, the network for peer-to-peer ride sharing and yours is a network for peer-to-peer hotel share, or, you know, room sharing. And we want to have a user on both networks or trade a ride for a hotel or something. Yep. How do you get those two decentralized blockchains to trust each other, right? And what is the best solutions right now? Well, there's there's new, you, it's very hard to do that with a 
uh, existing blockchain that didn't already have some kind of thought put into it in advance. Now you, they do it with like auctions or people can like try, like kind of like market making or liquidity or auctions or some ways. I'm not really an expert in it, but there are newer next generation blockchains where that's being built in from the start. Where it's like it has this feature where you can have two different blockchains all you know into the same spec that then they can like easily bridge between each other and so there's some coming out like that such as Polkadot and Cosmos and more mm -hmm. of these are, are trying to emphasize compatibility from day one although you know they're still still evolving you know they're not finished really completely finished yet either but that's an area the industry is, is actively working on Interoper interoperability sounds super interesting and important. Uh, it makes it, it's kind of like how we, each country has their own currency right now. And it's, it's similar in that sense. Like yeah. you want, I want to very easily make it so that yeah, on the ride sharing blockchain versus on the, on the rooms. Cause you don't want to trust a third party. Sure. You could do it easy with a third party. That's what a centralized exchange is. Yeah. We go to that exchange and I pony up this, I say, this is how much I want for my Bitcoin. That's how much you want for your ether. And the exchange matches the transaction, but then you're back to the same problem. The exchange can send to the transaction, can choose the transaction fees. <laughs> back like, you to know, the same problem. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, like, yeah. well, now we've got like, you know, you, you've added this centralized paradigm back yeah. again. And so everybody is, so there's decentralized okay. exchanges, which are one way of doing that, but even just this interoperability of, transactions on different blockchain networks that want to talk to each other or exchange value with each other or something. Scalability, privacy, interoperability. And now governance or upgradability is what I'd say the last one. And okay. so the problem is you've got this decentralized protocol. How do you vote in a new change? Because basically what you're saying is that like, you know, we agreed that there was 21 million Bitcoin when we made the damn thing, but maybe that was a mistake, right? Maybe we need to make, you know, 42 million. And how do we, how do we agree on a change when we said this was an immutable, you know, network? And yeah. so... Um, there, there, it started out, you know, Bitcoin, it's like, well, the miners all have to agree to just change the software they're running, right? And if enough miners run the new software, then it kind of takes hold. Otherwise, it splits in a, in, you know, in a hard fork or a soft fork. And um, that's not optimal, right? And it's very slow and it's very, you know, political and it can be very separating. But there are newer currencies where they're trying to actually put this, they call it governance process, like on the blockchain where like, I can say propose making some changes to this blockchain, maybe you know changing the rules in some way, and then everybody who owns that coin can vote. Oh, I like that change. I don't. And then if it votes, if they get enough votes, then it process goes to a testing period where they test the changes. And then you know if that if that succeeds, then like you know a month later it goes into this pre-implementation, and then it's automatically deployed in all the nodes. So Tezos is one coin that's mm -hmm. kind of pioneering this governance, uh, this in, this governance mechanism for. Chain, making a, amendments to the protocol, but many, many are, are, are working on this problem. But um, amendments to the protocol—that's what you, this governance. Yeah, yeah. How do you? It's upgrading. They call yeah. it governance, but it's really like governing changes to the protocol, right? There's different ways of govern. You, not to be confused with implementing governance on blockchain, where you could mm -hmm. call it like like a decentralized autonomous organization, or you know, there's different. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. like a separate issue. I'm just talking about like governance here. Is that like voting in changes to the protocol itself? Which can be very, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it can create a lot of uh, a lot of debate <laughs> when you're trying to change. It. Just the idea of trying to amend something that's immutable yeah. in code is already in itself, you know. You but that's kind of what we're experiencing right now, even with our constitution. Yeah, but, right. People are saying, "Oh, it's an outdated document," or "Oh, is it?" You know, like how, how do, do you add the amendments, yeah. which came in and did very important. Uh, yeah. pieces of addition to our code of law here and so maybe there is another way then to figure out how to amend the code um, in blockchains that make it um, a little bit more easy to do the upgrades especially um, to do the quantum resistant hash functions yeah. all these types of things like you need to amend as technology scale right and this gets into another point where it's like you can always take the easy way out and and make it more centralized to solve any of these problems but it's like the challenge is like how do you solve those problems while maintaining decentralization and so not every blockchain is equal some say oh we're just gonna you know make 21 people decide the blocks we have these 21 block producers and the community will vote them in and out and we're all going to trust them but because there's only 21 block producers we can make a really fast blockchain so now you've like sacrificed a certain amount of decentralization but you've added speed. But so others will say like, no, no, you can't do that. It has to be told. And like, it gets kind of philosophical as well as really kind of political, religious battles. So, but everyone has a different, in the blockchain industry has a different threshold for how much decentralization they think is needed and all the implications and difficulties that come with that level of decentralization. And so it's kind of, it's so it, people are always arguing about that.
Yeah, which the discourse is what gets usually the progress that we need. Do you have um, anything that you know people should know about, like trying to take um, business development of blockchain decentralization companies and try and help them uh, well, gain seed in Japan? Right. So, what does this look like when you try and migrate um, a company's decentralization protocols and infrastructures into another country? Well, you know, it's more a matter of building the community, building the early adopters, the customers, people who are going to use that protocol. Because the problem with a lot of these blockchains is that they have so little real use. It's mostly the value is driven by speculation. You know, they have a lot of potential, but it's like, yeah, until that smart contract library is template library is there, it's too hard for the average person to use. So there's not a lot of use, right? So you're kind of speculating by buying it now that, oh, it's going to be popular in the future. But mm -hmm. so everybody wants to get mindshare, build a community. Get, get users, get developers, get people understanding, get people building on it, get apps, you know, get transactions that are doing real applications despite all these limitations and difficulties, right? And so luckily, Japan being the number three economy and also having a vibrant um, cryptocurrency exchange market, there's a lot of interest in overseas companies to appealing to Japanese businesses and consumers there to build or developers to start using their product, you know? And so... That's a lot that I, so I tend to try to help those projects that want to build their community or um, customer base or mm -hmm. developer base in Japan, uh, and they're in you know, and vice versa too. There's some interesting Japanese projects that want to come to mm. America. You know, there's you know there's the big isolation and you know distance and language and culture and mm -hmm. customs and so so it's kind of a good niche, but it can be very challenging at times for sure <laughs> community customer base and developers are usually the things when you're trying to go across yeah. the borders yeah. you want to build those out and try and get the first stepping stones of your uh, company in that country. it's all like hearts and minds yeah hearts, hearts and minds and of minds. users and developers and then also customers yeah and it's, it's pretty fierce the competition you know just like Microsoft had the famous Stephen Ballmer video when he screams out, developers, developers. <laughs> like that was like, everybody's like, yeah, that was so true. It's like, you know, they knew that like, if they have the strongest development developer community, they'll have the best apps on their platform. You know, it's the same story with blockchain. And the best apps on the platform. Or, or use cases or, you know, it can be, you know, it can be an app or a currency or some token or, or, or some business process that's being moved to a blockchain. It doesn't necessarily have to be an app per se. But they, you know, the decentralized apps are these smart contracts that kind of govern certain outcomes based on certain logic that's been, you know, yeah. committed in advance. It could be even like a poker game where it's like, we're going to agree on these rules and now we make put in a smart contract. So now no one can cheat. You know, we can all mm -hmm. rest assured that someone's not going in there and looking at the other player's cards or altering the outcome of the game because we've all put in a smart contract. That could be like an app, although it's, it's kind of, it's a smart contract, but it's also an app, but this is a, a this is a power law issue where you have in the last ten years um, the big dogs that have come in and everyone's building apps on the big dogs as platforms and then that's kind of what it it's like how do you what happens when you have Google that takes all right all so this gets the, into yeah I know we talked a bit about this the other day too this whole like um, as the the centralized service gets start there's a great um, medium post on this why decentralization matters I I, forget, I think I think it's by like Chris Dixon or something but just just look at why decentralization matters and um, it goes into this case where it's like when one of these like services say it's Google say it's Twitter say it's Facebook when they launch or say it's Apple App Store or Google Play you know they really desperate developers oh please develop on our platform yeah you know um, we'll give you all these APIs you know you can do this and then. Um, as they get more and more powerful, they just boot off some of those. Like Twitter said, oh, we're no longer going to allow, you know, third parties access to our Twitter API, you know, because mm -hmm. we're, so, we're big enough now, we, we're just not going to do it. And all those people with apps, they all have to, like, go out of business. Or Jeez. then you kind of, you have, if you don't like that 30% commission, yeah, well, just don't use the platform. So, like, it, yeah. it turns out where, like, at the beginning, they court their users that are building the value of the network. But then as they get stronger and stronger, they're at odds to those users. Like, and they end up starting, like, you know, they, they start censoring them or controlling the platform, locking down the platform, controlling the fees, controlling what apps you can publish, you know, all that. And it kind of starts going against the community that built it. Um, even, you know, like ride sharing or apartment sharing, right? Room sharing. You know, it's the same thing when they're building the network. They're really nice. And they say, oh, we're just going to, you know, cut all the driver salaries now because we had all those promotions when we were starting the company. But now that we've made billions of dollars in this company, yeah, screw you guys. You know, like we're, we're, we're going to lower the rates, you know, and. In the centralized model, they don't have any any recourse, any option to to challenge that. But in a decentralized model, they could actually 
kind of like they can maybe even own in the network or vote on the the policies of the network or be rewarded in shares of the company for you know each month that they use the service you know there's all these like this co-op business model could be resurged into blockchain oh, of course we've got lots of taxation and legal things that need to change in the meantime but you can see that day probably coming where the the users of the network gain value or the people who provide the liquidity and the service of the network are also have a, have, a, have a skin in the game to get upside of the value of the network. It's not just like the investors that get all the rewards yes, yes. and the users and, and, and liquidity providers are forced to play in that by their rules. So that's a really fascinating area. And it's going to take time to, to, to uh, manifest, but you can see it starting to, and that's really exciting. This is one of, I think, one of the most important ways to perceive what's been happening with the emerging markets is that there's this deep uh, call for, yeah, come develop, come build with us. And then once the, the power lock kicks in and they have, you know, millions and millions of people using their service, then they get the ability to decide on what they want to do with the censorship server, the permission They choose the prices. Yeah, they, set, they, they, they approve all the apps. They, choo- they, pro- they prove how much everyone's going to get paid. They... They say, oh, you know, they can lock down different aspects of their platform that compete with them or... And this, in this case of decentralization, it would be something like a developer community that is the one that manages the... Right. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you could have some governance mechanism where like, say you had some token and the token holders get to vote on changes or, right, or, or there are no changes or, you know, or the users are the owners. Yeah. And they, they, they can decide the, the prices and this, you know, the changes to the system and much more democratically and then the also the the range of possibilities here people are talking about taking in biotech so many people are talking about taking my biometrics and just constantly streaming them up into the cloud and having it be on a secure immutable digital ledger that's constantly being parsed for oh is there a pathology that's developing let's uh make an intervention to keep the person in peak health you know there's like all the stuff with agriculture and the food industry people are like oh did this actually come from this farm we want to know if it came from this farm or not and there's so many of these different use cases decentralization in a sense is kind of like the internet like the internet just got into everything AI getting into everything it seems like decentralization is getting into everything is there anything that it's not gonna get into (laughs) That's a great question. Um, but what you're referring to is this immutable property as well, this kind of opt-in, how people are using it. You know, Those are, are, are very compelling reasons to switch to a blockchain-based solution. Yep. Unfortunately, you know, a blockchain really is an extremely inefficient database. You know? And <laughs> by, you know, this needs to be solved, but it's like you know, storing stuff in a blockchain. Well, you're storing maybe 10,000 copies of the same thing. You know? And it's like, now do you need all 10,000 copies or can we, can we start aging out old copies? And so... Yep. Unfortunately, there are a lot of benefits, but there are also a lot of drawbacks right now. Although, so we need time for some of those to be solved. But we, I think in time, those will be solved, and the scalability and even like the amount of data you can store in the blockchain will improve, and it will make more of those possible. Um, but we have still have to remind ourselves it's not like the the panacea. You know, like there there are you know cons to to you know to a blockchain one of which being all these you know redundant copies that are in that a are being sense stored. could this be something like an ASIC like an application specific integrated circuit for blockchain so there's going to be different blockchain protocols that are made for agriculture for healthcare etc stuff like that well um you know that's and then good, the interoperability yeah. is the crucial thing right right so, so so one of these next generation blockchains that has interoperability from the beginning can yet yeah, like these different so like say you have an agriculture thing that's built on that or a supply chain thing that's built on that same platform they can easily interoperate um, but maybe if it's like on a completely different platform well it can interoperate but maybe it has more restrictions or it's somewhat centralized you know there's all these different trade-offs unfortunately but we will see that improve for sure now the other thing you were saying you know is there any industry that's not, not going to be gonna, impacted yeah. yeah i mean you know you know, fin- so just look at like what has been impacted, right? Like, you know, fintech is an easy one because transfer of value is something that really needs this 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 property of like no cheating, no mo- this immutability and no censoring, right? And easy transact frictionless transfer. So, finance is, is a very easy one. Real you, estate so, like, was the other real one. Real estate, yeah. Like then you have other other transfers of value. Maybe it's it's a transfer of value of real estate mm-hmm. or some right or some you know stock or equity or revenue re- share in a, in a physical asset or revenue stream or a company. Those are also very easy to grasp. 
then you get into like kind of like these intermutab- immutability aspects, like you were saying, like the supply chain, where is stuff coming from? Mm-hmm. Can we guarantee that it's never that it's that no one has changed the 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 source that this the the log of every place this thing has been in? Now, yeah. maybe when you put the data in, it has to be audited so that you make sure you're like your you know every data input is kind of like a potential weakness if you put the wrong data in even in supply chain, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, if, yeah. if they're, you know, each warehouse has to be scanning all the items that go in, honestly, they have to maybe audited, you know, and checked. But then once it's in there, you know, like, well, no one could have changed this this log of like all the places this item has come from. So this immutability, that's really good for auditing mm-hmm. as well. You know, auditing, it could be auditing the location, auditing any business process, right? This immutability. And then this, uh, you know, um, getting rid of the intermediary. Well, we have so many intermediaries in our society. So, you know, the, I think you're going to see more and more areas that, that, that you know, that, that it's adopted by reaching into maybe, you know, media, content creation, advertising, you know, ad- matching ads, viewing ads, um, you know, creating content, attributing content, tracking royalties, tracking intellectual property, yeah. um, you know, doing it in a way that's that's audited and transparent and you know like no one's you know and 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 regimented where it's not like i'm going to get my royalties two months later and they, they might say oh we didn't approve those because they're from this this unauthorized country or this unauthorized user so you're just not going to get those these are a lot of problems people have now but like putting all that in a blockchain makes yeah. it very um you know Co- codifies it yeah it codifies it really and well and also um but, iot and robotics yeah, iot oh, like m to m machines talking to each other yeah. they can send little transactions to each other you know they can send value or exchange data or verify their identities um yeah and in ai is one the problem is ai is such big data sets that you can't really store that in a blockchain right now but maybe you can store it in a decentralized database and link that into the blockchain but you're you know people are working on on that so i just want to say like not all these are really doable using today's technology because maybe the database the size of the data is too big or it's too you know too fast or you know too many transactions but as the underlying blockchain technology improves more of these use cases that are possible will materialize but maybe some yeah. i mean so we're starting to see the easy ones materialize now but there's a whole lot more out there waiting in the wings you know everything from like tracking maintenance you know you could track like airplane servicing or oil field servicing we have all these mm-hmm. different parties doing operations on a common asset and you're not really sure like do they really clean the oil well do they really you know take out the oil do they do what they said they were that's one use case that some people are doing same thing with like an airplane servicing well this part was put in here and then it was cleaned there and like it was refueled here all these different parties are modifying the same data but instead of having all these different silo databases where they could all be kind of modified by a, a tr- centralized admin Put them all in one database and all in one blockchain database like you know it's 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 in sync no one can go in and change the other parts these are some areas that that people are working on now that are feasible using today's technology but um it'll just keep expanding into many areas but you know it's still it's not the panacea it's not you can still put bad data in you can you know like yeah. you know i could i could lie at when it in the warehouse and say some other package came and put that in um so you still have to have checks and balances when you're when you're dealing with like physical inputs um but, you know, people will, you know, like we have ISO certifications and we have sanitation inspections and like, I think there'll be procedures in place for that mm-hmm. type of thing. Um, yeah, that something about it seems like there's going to be a, a better and better uh, application specific uh Oh, Pro- you know, protocols. Yeah, you know, I'm not I, sure. The, the, your like whole machine comment, to ma- yeah, machine to machine is kind of interesting because it's going to require a specific style. Right. That in and, and like there's so many machines talking to so many machines. Yeah, there might be an ASIC in some yeah. IoT device or some node, but the whole idea is like your your wallet basically is just going to run some software on your computer or your smartphone. But yeah, but the, the physical hardware devices they might have some kind of ASIC processing. It. Yeah, I have some um, other thoughts. Okay, so these other thoughts are um, f- a couple like interesting rapid fire ones. Um, first one is so many people have commented on this that they think that that this that this beautiful technology was gifted to us by something that's oh. not even human <laughs> what <laughs> is satoshi all, nakamoto getting all mystic on me um yeah i know well personally i think it's a group of people maybe government or maybe just like anarchist type people who wanted to have you know like unstoppable transactions for free economy or it could be some faction of the government that really that's that maybe it's some white hats who thought like well we need to implement this so we can rebuild the current financial system i feel like there's got to be some amount of divine inspiration in it somewhere personally because it's definitely not one person because it's too complex to be de- designed by one person you know 
personally, I think. So I, mean, I don't think it's anything to do necessarily with Japan either. I think it's a group of individuals. You know, maybe some of them did have some, you know, off-world interaction or inspiration from some other realm, possibly. Now, are they part of a government unit, like some secret government unit, or some, you know, some white hat group, or even just some anarchist group that it's like, yeah, we want it, we want to do, you know, transactions without having anybody get in our way. Could be any of those. Um, but it's brilliant how they pulled it off, right? Like no one, no. If if there was a Satoshi Nakamoto. That would be the, the government could like go and imprison that person and force them to change the code or do and they couldn't really do that but like they, they could really cause havoc because there's no person to go after it's it's the beauty of it right the way it was like yes. released in phases it's like there's no person to attack yes. and, and you know it's, it's just so beautiful how like yeah so i really don't think one person could have thought all that on their own it's too perfect right yeah these ways of deploying code updates to society, I think, may become more and more popular over time. People may like to just deploy things in a very uh, anonymous way and then make it so that um, it, people can reap the benefits of those deployments. And I, I, and I, look, I look forward to things right, you like can, that. You can build some service, put it on the blockchain and let everybody use it, right? Like maybe it's some, you know, it, it could be anything, you know, it could be some data marketplace where it's like buyers, I can go and, you know, upload my biometric data and you, and you can buy it off me and it's just matching buyers and sellers. And it could just be like this, they call it a utility, right? Where it's like no one controls it, it's autonomously running. It's doing all the, you know, everybody can see the code so they can know that it's not cheating. It's not doing anything nefarious. And it's just, you know, exchanging your coins for mine for this data. And it's, it's like you can make this utility and just put it out there and anybody can use it. Could be on planet, could be off planet, you know. And like, even non decentralization and blockchain related ideas that could come to our world um, that people could birth into our world anonymously uh, right you just like, go and make this decentralized system and put it out there and it's kind of self-sufficient right? yeah. yeah create yeah, this, some sort of new way for us to yeah. um, be able to uh, to to measure the chemoelectroconnectome in your brain and instead of saying that you are the one that owns it uh, rather deploy it anonymously and see what happens with uh, that style of, of thinking um, yeah we should, yeah that's great point. yeah stuff like that's really interesting to great me point. um i also want to know what has been your relationship with the reason why all of this even exists why are we even here what created this what well, is the nature of this reality yeah i mean yeah i good good, good question um you know, obviously mankind is being more aware more interconnected we were in this big societal change of transparency where like previously opaque processes are coming to the light. Data leaks so easily. Um, people share information. That's part of it. But people also are more curious. You know, they're raising their vibration. They're more, they're more, um, more a lot, you know, more, more aware, more conscious. And I think there's all that's, that's the backdrop that, that we're looking at. And then as we're becoming more aware, we start to realize, well, wait, I kind of gave away too much of my power to that authority over there and they're really ripping me off they're just like you know bought, selling reselling this service to me but they're charging this much more and they're not really providing much value i didn't realize like there's there's all these like leeches like what is it um rent so they, they say in the industry rent converting yeah rent seeking um intermediaries to yeah. what is um yeah to to basically peer to peer so it's like there's <laughs> yeah. all these rent seeking intermediaries in our society and they're taking this huge leech tax on all of our transactions our prosperity they're saying that money where you know are they giving it like oh they're, they're like the rich families or these powerful elites or the deep state or um whoever right this this money is being funneled somewhere but we're not getting it you know but then you can actually see well with this and they're not only that they could be interfering with the transaction censoring them changing them and it's like well oh, gee i never realized all the intermediaries in our society that are you know charging these huge fees and doing very little now in fairness those processes used to be a lot harder you know like it used to be men you know Sending an international bank transfer, I'm sure, like back, you know, before when the computers were just getting started, actually was a lot of manual labor and stuff. But it's gotten to the point where it's basically all automated, but they're still charging these exorbitant rates because they can, you know. And then they get these these rent seeking intermediaries who are ingrained. They're maybe protected by laws or business relationships, and they're just getting all this money for doing nothing. Maybe it's credit card transaction processing fees, or maybe it's you know money transfer fees or whatever. And it's like, are you really doing three percent worth of work, you know, for that? My, or you know, it's you know probably not, but people are awakening to that fact. And they're also awakening to like the, the debasement or you know the inflation of our monetary supply and all that, and and they're they're kind of taking their 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 
their their self sovereignty back um, yeah. right now, and it kind of fits perfectly into block. Well, you know, using blockchain and decentralization, you actually can improve a lot of these processes, which you've now awakened to how bad they have been for all these years. You know, and so that's kind of the backdrop I see. Um, I also like the words that you use there. You said that the nature of the reality is becoming more alive. It's becoming more interconnected. And yeah. then there was this. There's these ways that we get like, oh, well, why am I paying so much money to the, th the third to the third party? And then you kind of wake up more, and you we create solutions to that issue that arose in as part of this uh, creation that we're embedded in. Um, another question I think is important to ask you: um, Do you think that humanity is a biological bootloader for digital super intelligence well i'm not a believer particularly in the singularity you know i think i think people try to i think uh technology is kind of or as much as i love technology i think um this whole like man merging with machine i think is very against like spirituality because really i think we ourselves can do a lot of these. I mean, there might be some, you know, conversion. I don't think it's going to be like a cyborg. Or, you know, I think some of this, you know, they've got all these brain machine interface stuff they're working on. But I think a lot of that, like, if we become more spiritual and tap into our own innate abilities, we can do a lot of that stuff without having to rely on machines. And so people are like, well, we'll just do it all with machines. But it's like, well, you could, or you could become more aware, more, more intuitive, more trusting your own feelings, more psychic or whatever, if you just stopped and meditated more or you trusted yourself more and i think that i hope that that will also gain in uh, in popularity and also awareness so that people don't think like i have to i feel like there's this feeling it's like i have to rely on technology to make myself a better human but i think really people can look inside and and we can evolve now i'm still working on this personally you know it's not like i can i'm not a, you know i'm not like psychic i don't have a lot of these abilities yet but i feel like we all can develop these abilities a lot more than we are and not have to rely on technology as much as people think we're going to have to rely on technology. So I'm not really like a fan of this whole singularity and machines, you know, making man better. Because I think like that's going to come with a lot of other risks because those machines are also going to be able to control man or people will control the machines or you're going to give up some of your humanity or, you know, I, I, I really think that that's kind of the wrong way to go personally. But, you know, this is all kind of conjecture at this point. Okay. And then, <laughs> personally. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, how, how, how about... Um, what about the deepest emotion that you've ever felt? Um, you know, I would say probably the deepest emotion is after you have kids. You know, this is kind of cliche. It's not, I'm not even really sure how to answer that question. But probably, you know, like, you know, there's this whole thing of service to others versus service to self. Mm. And that's part of the human evolution is that, like, as you become more service to others, you are fulfilling your mission here on Earth. And what is one of the things that forces you to be service to others but having a kid it's like you can't expect that baby to like do any of this stuff you're gonna have to do <laughs> stuff for it, right so no matter how selfish a person you are you know like you're gonna have to be less selfish if you have a kid especially mm -hmm. for you know for moms but also for dads right and so that whole path on like trying to give service to others is is kind of tied into this yeah. and i feel like that you know once you kind of realize you know it's kind of you have to be comfortable with it. It's like, oh man, you know, now I have to spend all this. And you look at like how parents who have problem kids and they're with that kid for like 30, 40 years still like going at it. Like, you know, it's like amazing how, you know, you know, putting yeah. that other life, you know, equal or ahead of their own. And it's just like, they're not getting anything in return. You know, they're just doing it out of the goodness of their heart. And like that, I think that emotion and that transition to service to others is kind of this like probably the, one of the deepest lessons that I that, that, that we learn. Um, I love that. You know, it's kind of just, as you get old, as you get older, you kind of get wiser. But it's true. Like some people just never, they don't, you know, they're just always super selfish. But most people, as they get older, they get less selfish, and either they volunteer or they have kids or all that. Or the universe will force you to in some way too, if if, if you're holding out mm -hmm. <laughs> many mm -hmm. times. What has been your relationship with the? with creation or with the divine or with God or with infinite consciousness or whatever you want to call it? What has been your relationship with that as you've grown through your life? Well, I'm lucky I was never subjected to the dogma of an organized religion. I did go to Sunday school. Like My mom wanted me to experience stuff. So I think she put me in Sunday school one summer and I like, you know, 
excitedly studied the Bible and like, you know, but I never, we never like, it wasn't like you have to do this or we never went to church every week. And I feel like my mom was very metaphysical as well as uh, what is like, um, you know, curious about many different disciplines. So she would always, you know, research them all and kind of, you know, take her best out of all these different ones. And I think that's a kind of cool attitude. Um, so that's kind of how I, I was, was raised and, you know, but for the longest time I was, you know, so I wasn't, so I, of course, I'm not trying to knock all religion, but a lot of organized religion is used to control people and there's a lot of dogma and there's a lot of mankind, you know, man using it for other reasons to control other men, um, in my opinion. And I'm not saying all religion is bad, but I'm glad, you know, I, that was, I wasn't interested in that dogma and that whole like go into it and FaceTime and, you know, I, I'd much rather like find my own path. And, and what did you find in that? Yeah, own no, path? my path, you know, um, you know, I, there was a period of time I felt like, well, who knows if there's a God, I must be agnostic. You know, you go through these phases. Oh, I think I'm agnostic, but no, I'm not really saying there is a God, but life is not a coincidence, right? Like it's too perfect to be a coincidence. And I think- Speak to that a little more. <laughs> yeah. Too perfect to be a coincidence. Yeah, that, I mean like the whole, yeah. I, I mean, I don't want to get started on, on a whole long discussion here, but there's, you know, really, I think, what I've, well, the realization that I've come to is that this is really a classroom, right? And we come here to live certain lessons and evolve. And um, it's not that like this is the only game in town. It's not like this was just, we just happened to like evolve from like an amoeba to a person and there's only one place in the world like this and we're so special. And I really think it's, it's, it's everything, every day, every experience is teaching you in some way. And, um, you know, it doesn't make it any easier, but at least you can kind of like try to have a good mi a mindset to be a good student, you know, be a good student yeah. in the game of life. It's hard knocks, but you know, we're here, we might as well make the best of it. But I, I feel like there's, there's definitely the rules of our reality, all that I feel, yeah, it's definitely been set up by some higher force, whatever that is. And we are here experiencing it because it's fun and it's educational and it's, it's giving us, um, yeah, and we're growth, right? And and we're just trying to grow as souls. And um, I love that, Jim. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Oh, you're really so, kind. Every moment is a beautiful experience of some sort, some sort of a lesson, something to yeah. learn, some way for this creation to experience itself. And yeah, to, yeah, you're right. Yeah, exactly. And, exactly. and so all of us having that here and wherever else is uh, such a beautiful process of growth and such it's a. It's not easy. It's hard work, right? It's hard knocks, but 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 it's fun, right? Like. How would you know, like you know, how, what it felt like to hug somebody, or to go on a swing, or you know, ride, or, or watch a movie if there was no concept of time, you know, or have all these experiences, right? Like, it's it's definitely a thrill, but it doesn't make it any easier. <laughs> how do you um, help uh, your uh, your your girls who are t three uh, and th six, yeah, three and six, now, three yeah. and six yeah. now? How do you? Um, yeah, you're like, whoa, that is shit went by fast. So how how do you um help with the rapidly changing world that we're going to with all the different technologies and stuff, and also that statement that we just talked about with this being a classroom, this creation being classroom. Yeah. How 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 can how do you work those things into your Yeah, and to be honest, you know, children? they're so young, we haven't done a lot yet, but I think kind of understanding cause and effect and like your actions and the outcome they have on other people, you know, I think kids are by their nature are just selfish because of course, like that's how you are when you're young. You just want more and you want you be gratified and you want what you want. And so but you can hopefully instill upon this like, well, there's a limited resource and if you don't, if you have it, somebody else doesn't have it or you can share your limited resource with somebody else or you, you might do this action, but look how it's gonna affect that person, kind of this cause and effect and sharing. I think they can kind of start to grasp those concepts. Now, hopefully they, um, they resonate with it and it doesn't cause them to like become more selfish. Now, I haven't quite, this is a chapter I'm still fairly <laughs> writing, I feel, yeah. but I kind of look at it from that perspective you know and like teaching them the value of life you know the value you know value of work and the impact of their actions and and you know and trying to help other people um some of all that but you know it's not easy and i'm not you know i'm still i'm still figuring out a lot of it i mean there's still how young is too young i don't know you know but hopefully they can at least see what the parents are doing and emulate that so yeah um and then and then how about um we 
we we we have to ask you the the the, the questions that we ask at the end of the show. <laughs> right. Um, the first one is: Are we in a simulation? Um. Well, it depends how you define simulation, but yeah, I mean, life could just be. I mean, it's like a game, right? Like we basically say, oh, I think, yeah, it could be a simulation. It's like, here are all the rules of the simulation. Like you're doing some atmospheric simulation of how the wind particles are affecting the sun and changing the weather. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, here's the laws of physics. Here's like the laws of gravity. Here's the laws of, you know, like cause and effect, karma or whatever. And it's like, yeah, now go and play in that sandbox. So it's like your inter. So maybe you have this free will to kind of, you know, choose the path in this simulation, but you're still governed by this set of rules, which are kind of inescapable, at least at this point. Maybe as a collective, eventually we modify them, but they seem pretty fixed to me. Um, but maybe as our consciousness evolves, we we got we we governance and we 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 vote in a new upgrade to the system. I don't know about that, but or we create quadrillions of simulations with new yeah, rules. Yeah, maybe ourselves. another way of looking yeah, at it. Yeah. Um, so I do feel like in in in, in if you call that a simulation then yeah maybe it is a simulation but i mean it's not like someone i don't think it's like people predetermined our path through it but maybe there were certain outcomes which were more probable just like you know that wind particle it's 80 percent chance it's gonna blow up there you know 20 percent chance it's gonna blow down here maybe the same in our life like we knew about these probabilities and then we go in and then we just start you know finding a path through governed by being governed by these rules and so maybe that is a simulation but it's not like it was a mm -hmm. predetermined thing that somebody else is just running or something what do you think is most beautiful in this creation? Well, I mean, really the beauty of nature, I guess, you know, just like how every, you know, it's like every moment has some beauty in it. Maybe it's the clouds, maybe it's the, 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 the trees, the branches, the leaves, you know, like all these, all the, you know, like there's such beauty in, you know, the cell, the organism, the shape, the, the you know, everything is just, it's, you know, it's, it, the de I guess the, the the design of what is it um uh what's the word I'm looking for um gestalt or whatever where it's like every every little you know or or also gestalt but also fractal where it's like yeah. you know well you know the the animal has these organs and these cells and these and after a while they these and these DNA and then that repeats in this pattern it's just like all this the way all these different complex systems all relate and also just like the beauty to watch you know the beauty to listen to the to music or birds or see the sunset it's like every every moment has some beauty in it if you just you know observe it and so i think that's mm. that's that's really you know fun i wish we could kind of see the full spectrum of light and maybe hear more frequencies and have a little bit more awareness to all the emf out there but still we have a pretty good you know range of vision and we may be hearing. augmenting our senses towards that direction. yeah i hope so i think agreed you can totally in in every experience every moment there is beauty to be seen yeah and maybe some uh have more like the children and things like that that you've experienced that have had maybe a little bit more a different type of beauty or yeah uh, um, natural you know they they're unreserved you know yeah yeah um yes, things unpretentious like yeah on yeah they're not they're not fake you know they're it's very hard they, i mean they, of course they can they can eventually pretend but but they're they're much more real yeah this has been so interesting, Jim. Thank you for coming on our program. Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed this talk. It. Yeah, thank you for having me, and good luck with your channel. Yeah, thank you. you're thanks. doing a great job. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, we, right. get, we get the opportunity to sit down with people like you and help share these messages. Congrats on all the great work. Also, on trying to build the new world with blockchain and decentralization, and also on trying to bring it around the world to places like Japan. Um, also, Everyone, have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, and people online about these types of subjects. Have more conversations about decentralization and their future with technologies like blockchain. Check out the links in the bio below to Jim on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Check those out. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, the organizations in your communities that you believe in. Support them. Help them grow. You can find all of Simulation's links below, all of our links. Check those out. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you very much for tuning in. We love you very much, and we will see you soon. Thank you all. Peace. <laughs>